Good afternoon. I'm Sherry Freer, and it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. I'm joined this afternoon by my colleagues, Paul Lusignan, Julie Ernstein, and Lisa Davidson. The National Register has relaunched its effort to update the TCP Bulletin, last issued in 1998. I have a 30-minute presentation to share with you on questions raised about National Register practice and TCPs over the past two decades, and how we have hopefully answered them in the draft TCP Bulletin issued for comment as of October 27 of this year. As we move through this presentation, I'll refer to the original bulletin as just that, the original bulletin, and to the recently released version as the draft bulletin. In closing, I'll provide an update on the National Register and National Historic Landmarks initiatives that I introduced last year at the Pass Forward Conference, and these were initiatives to enhance the diversity of National Register listings and NHL designations. The title of this presentation comes from Dolores Hayden's 1997 book, The Power of Place. It was my encounter with her book that gave me the words to express what I long thought was true, that seemingly ordinary places that hold public memory remain unacknowledged for many cultural, ethnic, and identity communities. Back in the 90s, when I was studying historic preservation and landscape architecture, we called those places vernacular buildings and cultural landscapes. Today, we might call them traditional cultural places. Here's the agenda for this session. First, to set the context for this presentation, I'll do a quick run through of National Register practice. Next, I'll review the history of the development of the original bulletin and its revisions in the late 90s. Then I'll present some of the issues that have been raised in the decades since about potentially National Register eligible TCPs, along with an analysis of the changes from the original bulletin to the draft bulletin that address those issues. Finally, I'll lay out the path to revision and reissuance of the TCP bulletin. And along the way, there will be a few pop quizzes. The National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 authorized the Secretary of the Interior to expand and maintain a National Register of Historic Places of buildings, structures, objects, sites, and districts significant in American history, architecture, archaeology, engineering, and culture. Listing in the National Register brings recognition as well as potential financial benefits, but listing doesn't guarantee that a place won't be altered or demolished. To be listed in the National Register, the resource under consideration must be an actual place or object. It must possess historic significance under one or more National Register criteria and it must retain the integrity to convey that significance, although not all seven aspects need be present. Here are a few National Register listed TCPs that are representative of the different property types. Bohemian Hall at Park is listed as a building, Horn Mound as a structure, Sleeping Buffalo Rock as an object, Takati Peak as a site, and Tarpet Springs Greek Town Historic District as, of course, a district. To assist in the preparation of nominations, the National Register has issued guidance, most often in the form of bulletins. You'll find most of these bulletins, along with other guidance, on our website at the link shown and to be pasted in the chat. Here you see examples of guidance for specialized property types, such as post offices, which are of course buildings, ships, which are structures, and rural landscapes, which may be sites or districts. And here you see examples of bulletins issued to provide guidance for applying National Register criteria. Bulletin 15 is foundational for evaluating and documenting any potentially National Register eligible place, providing guidance for all criteria and, all, and criteria considerations. Bulletins 22 and 32 provide further guidance for criterion B, places associated with significant persons, 
and criterion consideration G, places associated with the recent past. Several bulletins focus on unique places, such as residential suburbs, mining properties, and yes, traditional properties. The original TCP bulletin was published in 1990 in response to the amendments to the National Historic Preservation Act. Those amendments focused on preserving and conserving elements of cultural heritage. The bulletin was revised and reissued in 1992 and again in 1998 to address questions about religious places, property types, and significance. And now it's time for our first pop quiz. A traditional cultural place, a TCP, is a National Register property type. Is the statement true or false, or are you not sure? And I believe we have about 20 seconds to answer and correlate the responses. I have set a timer for myself, so I will be sure to keep track of that and move on as appropriate. According to the poll, 70% say false, 20% say true. And the answer is false. A TCP is not a National Register property type. The TCP you see here is La Wait La La, in English, Mount St. Helens, and it is listed in the National Register as a site. Oh, and it appears that 10% were not sure. A TCP may be classified as a building, structure, object, site, or district. For consideration for listing in the National Register, like any place, a TCP is evaluated according to National Register criteria for significance and integrity. Places of traditional cultural significance have been listed in the National Register since 1969 with the designation of Medicine Wheel, Medicine Mountain as a National Historic Landmark. In 2011, the National Park Service began work to update the TCP Bulletin, but in 2017, the work was placed on hold. In 2021, the NPS resumed this work and with the release of the draft bulletin on October 27, the reissuance process has restarted. In the decades since the original bulletin was last revised, many questions have been asked about nominating TCPs to the National Register, and the recently released draft bulletin attempts to address those. In the next series of slides, we'll compare language from the original bulletin to the draft bulletin for a few of the most commonly asked questions. What is a traditional cultural place? There is no change from the original bulletin to the draft bulletin in how a traditional cultural place is defined as applies to potential National Register eligibility. A traditional cultural place is a building, structure, object, site, or district that may be eligible for inclusion in the National Register for its significance to a living community because of its association with cultural beliefs, customs, or practices that are rooted in the community's history and that are important in maintaining the community's cultural identity. The draft bulletin expands on this definition by providing a list of the essential characteristics of a potentially National Register eligible TCP. One, the place must be associated with and valued by a living community. Two, that community must have existed historically and continue to exist in the present. 
Three, the community must share beliefs, customs, or practices that are rooted in its history and held in the present. Four, those shared beliefs, customs, or practices must be important in continuing the community's cultural identity and values. Five, the community must have passed down the shared beliefs, customs, or practices. Six, the shared beliefs, customs, or practices must be associated with a tangible place. And seven, to be listed in the National Register, the place must meet National Register criteria. It must have significance. That is, it must be important in the community's history, architecture, archaeology, engineering, or culture. And it must have integrity. That is, it must retain the ability to convey its significance. Before we continue, it's time for another pop quiz. Only Native American places can be included in the National Register as TCPs. Is the statement true or false, or are you unsure? And we'll take about 30 seconds for voting and to uh, tabulate those votes. And this statement is false. 97% of you said this is false. 2% were not sure. Well done. Here you see the Green River Tri Drift Trail in Wyoming. It was listed in 2013 as a district. This 58 mile long corridor played a significant role in the development of the ranches in the upper Green River Valley. Remember ranchers still use the main trail and its spurs to move cattle. Like people the world over, Americans of any cultural or ethnic background may have places to which they attribute traditional cultural significance. And those places that meet the National Register criteria may be nominated for listing or recognized as eligible for listing in the National Register. Another question frequently asked over the years has been, how is the period of significance determined? As in the original bulletin, the draft bulletin provides two different kinds of periods for a National Register nomination. The period of significance may be the period of time in which the place gains significance according to the beliefs of the community that values it. Or the period of significance may be for the period of time during which the place has actually been used for cultural purposes. Again, the passage of time since the original bulletin was issued has allowed for the inclusion in the draft bulletin of many listings to provide examples for guidance. On the left is a listed TCP with a period of significance determined by when the place gained its significance according to the beliefs of the community that values it. In the traditions of the several tribes that value Gold Strait Canyon Sugarloaf Mountain, Creation to the present is the period over which they conducted traditional cultural practices at numerous and specific locations here. On the right is a TCP with a period of significance determined by the period over which the place has actually been used for cultural purposes. Pasqua Plaza has served as the location for ceremonial activities of the UMA community since Pasqua Village was founded in 1921. The period of significance then is 1921 to the present. Common to both these TCPs and indeed to many TCPs is the fact that the period of significance extends to the present. Recall the definition of a TCP. It is a place that may be eligible for inclusion in the National Register for its significance to a living community because of its association with cultural beliefs, customs, or practices that are important in maintaining the community's cultural identity. So it follows that if a place is important in the continuity of a community's cultural identity, 
the period of significance continues into the present. But that idea of continuity has raised questions over the years. So let's consider this issue. To be eligible for inclusion in the National Register as a TCP, a place must have been in continual use by the traditional community that values it. Is this statement true or false, or are you not sure? And we'll take another 30 seconds to uh, tabulate the responses. And the responses are 44% say it's true, 37% say false, and 16% say not sure. The statement is false. The, the Lucenio ancestral origin landscape in California was listed in 2014 as a district with a period of significance of creation to the present. It's recognized by the indigenous people of the area as the place of creation and the period of use for traditional purposes extends back to this time, even though the people that value the place were forcibly removed from it. Although they did not have access to it in contemporary times, they maintain their cultural traditions associated with the area, even as it was taken over by other governments and privatized. A place may indeed be important in the continuity of a community's cultural identity, despite the community's inability to access the place for some period of time. Here you see the Akmolgi Old Fields in Georgia, determined eligible for listing in 1997 for its cultural and historical significance to the Muscogee Nation. The Muscogee had no choice but to physically abandon the area upon their forced relocation by the federal government in the early 19th century but they never forgot this place. They revere it as their ancestral homeland and it is as significant now as it was then to the Muscogee cultural identity. Questions have been asked about how to resolve conflicts between historical and contemporary sources about the significance of a place. In documenting any place, be it a site significant for its role in cultural identity or a house significant for its architecture, a nomination preparer may encounter conflicts between historical and contemporary accounts, between what is documented in books and what the community shares about it. Both the original and draft bulletins stress that traditional knowledge is an independent line of evidence provided by the people who are the authorities in their culture and the connection that culture has to a place. However, this is not to say that thorough, thoughtful research and documentation is irrelevant in preparing a nomination. Recall that National Register regulations require that a nomination be adequately documented and professionally and technically correct and sufficient. And that remains true whether the place is a TCP or an architectural gem. In these passages, the same example provided in both the original and draft bulletins demonstrates the important connection between traditional history, traditional associations, and a traditional cultural place. A specific example is included in the draft bulletin. This image shows Spirit Mountain in Nevada, a site associated with the creation stories of several tribes. The mountain continues to serve an essential role in their traditional cultural practices and beliefs. Tribal members shared information on the significance of this place with the understanding that they could not provide detailed information because of its extreme spiritual sensitivity. Nevertheless, the nomination is well documented with both historical and contemporary sources, including oral histories.
Over the years, many questions have been raised about how to assess a place's integrity. The original bulletin's use of the phrase integrity of relationship has been misunderstood as adding an eighth aspect of integrity to the seven existing aspects of location, setting, design, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. In the draft bulletin, integrity of relationship has been reframed as, is the relationship essential? The same question could have been asked as, is the relationship integral? But using this closely related I word risks the same confusion. Likewise, integrity of condition has been restated as, does the relationship endure? to provide guidance in assessing whether a traditional community's relationship with the place endures despite changes to the place. And now for our final pop quiz. This is an image of a National Register listed TCP. Is this statement true or false or are you unsure? And we'll again take another 30 or so seconds for you to answer the question and for us to correlate the results. As you think about your answer, consider this photo from 1976. The statement is true. The Creek Council tree site in Oklahoma was listed in 1976 as a site for its historical and cultural significance to the Muscogee Nation. Members of the tribe arrived in the vicinity in 1836 after their forced relocation from their homeland in the Southeast by the federal government. They chose the site of this magnificent oak as the gathering place for tribal business, ceremonies, feasts, and games. Despite the visual intrusion of modern development, the place continues to be significant to the Muscogee Nation, whose members hold an annual celebration here. The results of the poll, 48% say true, 50% say not sure. And many thanks to Felicity Good, Historic Preservation Planner in the Tulsa, Oklahoma Planning Office for this recent image. And again, the passage of time since the original bulletin was issued has allowed for the inclusion in the draft bulletin of many more examples of National Register listed TCPs addressing the issue of integrity. On the left is Cave Rock in Nevada, listed in the National Register in 2017. It continues to be regarded as a sacred place of extraordinary spiritual power to the Washoe people, despite the intrusions of a double bore vehicle tunnel and for a time, recreational rock climbing. On the right, we again see La Waitlatla, Mount St. Helens. Listed in 2013, it continues to be a place of traditional activities despite the dramatic change in its appearance created by the enormous crater from the 1980 eruption. Let's take a look now at the proposed path to the reissuance of the bulletin. We've developed a 15 month schedule aiming for issuance by December, 2023. The schedule assumes six months to conduct partner and public outreach and government to government consultation with Native American tribes, Native Hawaiian organizations and Alaska Native corporations. The draft bulletin can be downloaded from the NPS Planning, Environment, and Public Comment website at the link shown here and pasted into the chat. This site is also where we'll be posting the consultation and outreach schedule. We anticipate conducting those sessions via Zoom and we'll be posting information here later this month. Comments may be made on the bulletin via this site or by email to the address shown here. You may also mail comments to us in Washington, D.C. Before I end this presentation, I'd like to update you all on the initiatives I introduced at last year's Pass Forward Conference. 
In March, the National Register Program began evaluating older listings to identify potential areas of significance related to cultural, ethnic, and identity groups. As discussed at last year's conference, the area significance categories have evolved and expanded in the decades since the National Register was formally established in 1966. The project's goal is to identify potential additional areas of significance for older listings and to work with partners and the public to update those nominations. We anticipate publishing the results of this work in 2023. This year has seen the release of several guidance documents. The NHL program has released theme studies on labor history and Cold War history. Remember that NHL theme studies can provide context for national register nominations, not only at the national level of significance, but at the local and state levels as well. These and other recent, recent theme studies are available at the NHL website, at the link shown here and pasted into the chat. In September, the National Register Program released the inaugural issue of the Best Practices Review to provide guidance on frequently raised questions about National Register practice. The first issue addresses evaluating non-historic exteriors. Future issues will be released quarterly, will address counting structures in historic districts, developing additional documentation for existing listings, and using oral history in nominations. Over the past year, we've been building a new sample nominations page featuring more than 100 nominations on a variety of topics. We anticipate this page going live later this month, although it will always be a work in progress as we add new listings. And with that, I'll conclude this presentation. I thank you for your kind attention. Paul, Julie, Lisa, and I look forward to your questions and comments. There were some really good questions in chat, and um, one of them was, uh, the first one is when we often get, you know, will the audience be able to access the slides? And someone from the trust had noted that presentations will be shared out with um, conference attendees. And we'd also like to note that past uh, presentations for the last couple of years are also posted on the National Register website. So you'll be able to catch up with this one or if you want, if you happen to miss last year's or the years before, you can catch it. And then uh, there was a question and I'll just read it from the chat. I'm wondering about the relationship between the TCP category and the larger prohibition on listing of churches and religious properties. Obviously, many TCPs have spiritual significance, are have spiritual significance. And then the question continues, are historically black churches, for example, eligible under TCPs, even while the National Register discourages church listings at large? I know there's a lot in there. So. <laughs> I would say generally the uh, the prohibition against religious properties uh, is always something to take into consideration. But the revisions to the National Historic Preservation Act that I referenced earlier uh, and our TCP guidance as well um, don't cast traditional spiritually used places as religious properties per se. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul for uh, a better answer because he has dealt with this uh, many, many times. Paul Signan is our senior historian. Many of uh, the states for which he does reviews are on the West Coast and uh, have been, been many uh, uh, locations, many, many places uh, that have spiritual significance to Native American tribes. Right. Thank you, um, Sherry. Um, in terms of Native American and, and um, those types of, of folks, we've basically said that um, if you look at their cultures, look at from their perspective, while we as, a, as an Eastern, you know, as a Western society may say that's religion, to them, it's, it's part and parcel of who they are. It is their culture, it is their identity. 
And so we don't treat those as, quote, religious properties. We say they're spiritual properties. They have cultural significance. And so that the, 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 the ramifications of um, religion um, that involve the criteria considerations really are not all that applicable in most cases for, for those kind of TCPs. But that also applies to non-Native American ones as well. Um, black churches um, are, are part of the cultural um, entity of, of the black communities. They're not simply places of religion. They're places of social and cultural importance. And when nominations emphasize those aspects of a significance, then they clearly would meet the criteria considerations. The criteria consideration really was developed early on to prevent nominations that were simply based upon a religious group so that you wouldn't come by and say, oh, this is a Catholic church, therefore it's eligible for the National Register. That there was that kind of separation between the religious aspect and the, 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 the significance of that. As we've evolved in those, we were looking at churches in particular, um, and oftentimes with minority communities, as much more than just the religious aspects to them. That's an important aspect, but there are also cultural and traditional um, associations. And therefore, I mean, TCPs, uh, black churches in particular, that this question can easily be documented as TCPs. Um, if again, there is a continuing community associated with them. And one of the examples I believe in the slideshow was of a, a church and cemetery collection um, in Louisiana that was associated with Creole of color. And for them, the church was a central point of social and cultural interaction as well as religious interaction. And it was keenly important for maintaining their cultural group down there. Um, and so it was listed as a TCP. And I was just dropping something in the chat to have moved over. <coughs> Excuse me. Could we take a quick second and just do introductions? Because folks had asked who's who, and I thought our names were all on the screen, but that may be the that may not be the case. Yes, thank you. Uh, I am Sherry Freer. I am chief of the National Register of Historic Places and the National Historic Landmarks Program. I've been in this role for about two and a half years now. Uh, I'll toss it over to uh, Paul. My name is Paul Lusikin. I'm a historian with the National Register of Historic Places program. Um, I've been with the Park Service for about 30 years now. And as Sherry mentioned, most of the states that I deal with are Western states. Um, I do have some East Coast states, but mostly Western states, which means I've been exposed to a lot of TCPs, particularly Native American TCPs. And therefore, I have this kind of back knowledge of, of TCPs, even though I'm not an anthropologist or an ethnographer. And Lisa? I'm Julie. Oh, oh no. <laughs> and I'm Julie Ernstein, and I'm a former archaeologist um, with the National Register and the National Historic Landmark Program. So Paul and I, and I have not been there for 30 years by any stretch, uh, had done many uh, reviews together. So um, I didn't want to get a jump on people's questions, but we do have some really exciting examples of, you know, carving a space in these nominations and, and demonstrating a lot of flexibility uh, with the criteria. And I've just recently moved on to another program, but I'm, I'm joining the team back here today to have this important conversation. And I'm Lisa Davidson. I'm program manager for National Historic Landmarks, and um, I'm here partially to listen to my more expert colleagues talk about traditional cultural places and be available for any um, National Historic Landmarks questions. I see one quick question that's easy to answer in, in the chat, um, and it's basically confirming whether it, buildings that are within TCPs are eligible for the historic tax credits, just as any other National Register listed property. Yes, um, the only qualification for for the historic tax credit is to be a is to be listed in the National Register of Historic Places as a contributing resource to a district or as an individually eligible resource. Um, so if it's and again, the the question would be: Is that specific building contribute to the TCP? 
So if it's like the, the, the Greek town in Florida, um, if it contributes to the significance of the Greek town TCP, it would qualify for the tax credits. If on the other hand, it's a Native American TCP in which the building is an intrusion or a non-contributing resource, then it would not qualify for the tax credits. And um, another audience member had asked if the draft TCP bulletin is available. And I had um, typed the address in so it could be shared. Uh, but that that document is currently uh, available for public comment. So we and there was a very long, complicated URL. So we absolutely uh, would very much appreciate people's comments on that. And I'm seeing that there is a question about whether different regulatory approaches uh, or regarding are there different regulatory approaches taken to TCPs, recognizing that the continuing use of the site is integral to its value. That is, I will say that is outside our lane. Um, and I'm sorry to be unhelpful on that. Um, the Advisory Council for Historic Preservation is the uh, federal agency that is responsible for uh, participating in 106 consultations. They don't always participate, but that's the word I'll use as opposed to, well, I could say oversight of the 106 uh, process, uh, the, the federal regulatory process whereby agencies do have to uh, take into account their, the effects of their undertakings on any national register listed or national register eligible property. Uh, they would certainly be the best people to contact, and we will look for a link for that, and we'll drop it into the chat. What the question does highlight, though, is the importance in National Register documentation mm -hmm. of outlining those aspects. You know, what are the char I mean, it's important in describing the TCP to describe what the character-defining aspects of that might be. For architectural buildings, those are clear characteristics. For TCPs, it may be things such as um, the, 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 the flora and fauna that may be associated with the site, um, the lack of auditory issues, um, and other things. So that you, you outline those such that they become much more important or useful management tools when someone then goes to the National Register for Eligible Resources and decides how best to manage or mitigate issues. Um, if it's not in the nomination, then you, they might be missing out something. And someone's mm -hmm. perspective on why the property is significant may differ from the traditional community's perspective on that. Yeah. And there's a question here that I'll, um, I'll tackle because it's got Criterion D. Uh, <laughs> can, it, can a TCP be eligible under Criterion D due to the significance of information that it has to the community rather than archeological information as judged by archeologists. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, a place connected with stories or teaching within, and it probably goes on to continue within the cultural tradition. And there were two really great recent examples of this. One is a multi-property submission that came from Washington State uh, called the Spiritually Significant Rock Features of the Southern Columbian Plateau and Okanagan Highlands in Washington State. Um, the authorship, it was written by the senior archaeologist with the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation and their archaeology program. It employed, a tr it, it ticked all the boxes and we were really happy to see it. Um, the chronology employed a tribally focused uh, chronology that built upon, but went in a slightly, uh, I'd say, augmented direction from sort of the standard regional chronology. The significance, this cover document, it absolutely noted from the outset that from the tribal perspective, it is the traditional cultural significance of these rock features that occupies primary significance. It kind of reframed uh, and moved, departed from a standard archeological notion of typology while still meeting the requirements of outlining registration requirements within a, a multi-property submission. And then probably more to your point, 
its approach to um, research questions, that that information potential, it claimed that uh, it claimed ethnographic space as the appropriate methodology for investigation, and and there are other um, really great examples. Um, a ballast island, uh, which was another nomination that just absolutely um, made abundantly clear that it was. Um, information from this site that was of significance to the tribe that trumped sort of standard archaeological uh, information and, uh, and included in those research questions, uh, questions that would be um, garnered via oral history, uh, ethnographic information and, and methods um, well beyond simply excavation. I see a question that asks about National Register criteria, asking whether we would advise uh, or whether a TCP analysis would be used as a catch-all to gain designation for places that would not meet National Register criteria A, B, C, or D. Uh, all properties listed in the National Register or proposed for listing in the National Register do need to meet one, one criteria, at least one. Um, most often we see TCPs come in under a criterion A, a can be a uh, history or pattern of history, which also encompasses uh, cultural activities. Activity, cultural activities are part of a traditional community's history. So uh, the TCP uh, uh, is not a workaround uh, and it's not a catch-all as uh, anything nominated to the National Register needs to meet uh, the criteria for evaluation, which means significance and integrity. Yeah, and and that that question raised a really interesting uh, point that's worth emphasizing. We we don't at the Park Service or our counterparts in state offices and other federal agencies. We don't tell people that they have a TCP. They tell us mm -hmm. that this place is significant to them as a as a TCP. Um, and, and I think that probably tied into a question that we're seeing. Are there standards, whoops, it moved. Are there standards for what the NPS considers to be a people or a culture? And, um, you know, a, a community comes to us and tells us about, about their history, whether it's, um, you know, they are members of a, a particular neighborhood, um, a particular congregation, a particular uh, tribal entity. Um, so that, that information, you know, comes from those folks and their history. I just want to point out for my colleagues, there are a few variations of the question about um, discussing integrity a bit more uh, in the chat. I think um, you covered this, Sherry, but I think it may be, um, be worth reiterating some of those points a little bit about um, how uh, integrity is, is handled a little bit differently for a TCP. Integrity is the ability of a place to convey its significance. Now, what that looks like, I'm sorry to say, depends, uh, but it does very much depend on how the community perceives that place whether the community can look at that place and recognize it for its significance. Um, in one of our bulletins, we say uh, one test for uh, a building is, say a 19th century building is, would a contemporary walking down the street, a 19th century contemporary walking down the street, recognize that building? Now that again is not to say that any building needs to be a pristine, encapsulated, perfect, uh, uh, Perfect, having perfectly transitioned into the 21st century, uh, modifications happen and, and those are always acceptable and to some extent. Um, but integrity is, is whether, particularly for a TCP, is whether it will be recognized by the people that value the place. What are they looking for? What do they value in that place? What about that place says to them, this is a place of cultural significance to us? Yeah, and, and integrity has always been based upon the significance of the resource. And so, again, the importance of a nomination documenting what about this resource, what either physical features or associated features are significant to the tribal community or to the traditional community 
then assessing the integrity of those factors and such that again if it's a a space that has that has no buildings on it then expecting materials or design to be aspects of integrity really are not going to have a lot of, of, of relevance as much as the associations of feeling and association um, and location and setting. Um, and so we, we would look to the nomination to highlight what are the important aspects of integrity and then to convey how those are still intact um, from largely, again, from the, the, the traditional community's perspective. Um, it's not purely and simply that aspect. There still has to be some assessment of physical integrity. Um, but the, the, the role of the different aspects of integrity change depending on the resource. And again, that's true for all sorts of property types, particularly for TCPs. Though. And, I, and I hope, and I think that's expressed in the bulletin, in the draft bulletin, um, because it's one of the factors that has come up a lot mm -hmm. in terms of, of who, who gets to say it has integrity or doesn't have integrity um, and what's the appropriate approach to do that. One of the audience members observes an idea developed within tribal meetings in North and South Dakota is this notion of a national register criterion E that uh, for resources that possess attributes and elements considered significant to indigenous groups, representations of cultural life ways, beliefs, ceremonial activities, customs, genesis or creation astronomies, artistic forms, technologies, or spirituality to include relationships to the universe in accordance with NHPA section 101D6 or 54 USC 302706. And um, that's certainly an interesting point. We would, I think, answer that we, we have currently listings that um, speak to many of, of these things, um, attributes and elements that are representative of life ways, beliefs, um, a, many different sorts of ceremonial activities, um, certainly um, origin, um, you know, genesis or creation activities. For instance, the, um, the spiritually significant rock features is just one example that I cited earlier. Um, there, there is a, a being known as rock who brought to people the notion of time immemorial. So that's, that is a, a frequent, um, uh, uh, detail that, that comes up. Certainly astronomies, um, uh, solstice, uh, and different sort of calendrical markings, artistic forms, technology, spirituality. Um, so the, the notion of needing to add another criteria where in many instances the existing criteria have have created space for these sorts of activities and historical events and that's that's where i think too the the samples in the nominate in the, the the draft bulletin will kind of highlight some of those um again it's very difficult for us to provide samples of TCP nominations because a lot of them do contain sensitive information. Um, but what we can present about those um, do show aspects of all of these kind of features and factors that really, I think, broaden the scope of what people think of in terms of properties eligible and listed in the National Register. Um, and, 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 you know, the, that, that, that has been a, a topic discussed in terms of the, 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 the fifth criteria and inc incorporation of it. But again, with, with Julie, we found that all of those kind of aspects can be um, placed into and under the current criteria. And here's an interesting sensory question. Has sound or smell, whoops, the question jumped, um, has sound or smell ever been, and I'll find it again, but um, has sound or smell ever been emphasized as a, 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 a means for con or an attribute of significance for a TCP rather than uh, what is visually apparent? 
I would say yes to the lack of sound. Um, when places are associated with vision questing or ceremonial activities in which seclusion or lack of distractions are important, then the lack of sound is a character defining element of the resource perhaps. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any in which sound has been a, 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 an active component of it, but I'm sure a case could be made for that as well. I mean, uh, the sound of rushing water um, associated with, you know, I mean, like, again, you know, there, there, there may well be. Um, smell, I don't think I've come across um, yeah. yet. It's interesting. And we have a question about what about an urban historic district that was inhabited by one immigrant group more than 50 years ago, but they have moved out and the area is now inhabited by another immigrant group for less than 30 years. The buildings are modified. Can the district be a TCP to the first group that lived there? I was thinking, of your, mod I was thinking of your modified casitas. I don't know if that would fit the bill. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's possible. I mean, again, it, it's TCP is not necessarily continued use so that the, the original minority community doesn't have to still live there. But their associations to that, their value of that community as part of their cultural identity would, would be important to, do, to document. And that may or may not be the case. Um, I think, you know, again, it, it may have to do with reasons of why they left the area, why they moved on. Um, but I don't think you could just make a, a, an automatic statement that because a group tradition lived here, it's a TCP, the whole concept of a TCP for eligibility in the National Register is because to a current day traditional community, they still value and have a beliefs or practices associated with that community. That may be the case, but on the other hand, it could also be that it's not a TCP, it might be eligible under criterion A for its historic significance as association with a particular <coughs> community. Um, mm -hmm. Those kind of things you have to balance and look at when you're looking at those kind of places. Um, there's an interesting question that poses um, on integrity, if a pre-contact mm -hmm. TCP has been destroyed by white settlement beyond just being denied access to the place, does that eliminate a location from listing? And um, I'm thinking of, for instance, Ballast Island in mm -hmm. Seattle that has been infilled. It's still there. It is simply... Um, uh, filled over by layers and layers and layers of, of rock. So it is it is physically inaccessible, um, but still is used and visited actively for, um, you know, for teaching uh, as a location of uh, important transfer of uh, intergenerational information. Uh, among a number of groups um, in and around uh, Elliott Bay and Puget Sound. Um, and on that issue of integrity, just uh, following up on a question that I see here, that if integrity depends on whether a member of the community can sense the significance of the place, how do the reviewers of the National Register nominations have a role and confirming whether that exists if they are not a member of the community. And that comes back to what Paul was describing earlier uh, with respect to documentation and the nomination. Simply tell us, simply explain it, spell it out. Uh, so help us understand. We are not in the business of uh, saying no to nominations. We like to list properties, but we do have that responsibility to ensure that they are adequately documented and it needn't be a huge lift. Um, we talked last year about uh, a documentation arms race where nominations are, are getting longer and longer. And that's not necessarily necessary, use that word twice, to, um, to adequately document a place. It could be 10 pages, it could be 20, it could be 30. I do recommend that they be 
more than the earliest nominations where we were seeing one, two, three page nominations. So documentation, explaining why a place is important, explaining why it's significant is important. And there's a question that says, if a place were listed before 1998 on the National Register, can it be amended instead of having to totally reapply under new TCP or other guidelines as to integrity or significance in the community? And I would say any, any nomination where new information and scholarship, be it ethnographic scholarship, oral history scholarship, folklore scholarship, scholarship in any discipline that that yields new information about additional significance, that that would be an entirely appropriate uh, reason uh, to prepare additional documentation for that, whether it's you know a site, a district, whatever form uh, it assumes. And if no one wants to. Does anyone I feel want to add to, I want to follow up on the uh, the question about um, access being an issue because mm -hmm. of ownership. Uh, I would say that you simply do the very best you can, and I appreciate that challenge. Uh, Paul, I'm sure you've encountered this in in the course of your career. Yeah, yeah. There, there are some cases in which you you have to do the best you can. You know, okay, you you may not be able to physically step on the site. Are there um, aerial photographs of the site for which you can, or the Google Earth? You know, what, what is what can you see from other places, other advantages to this resource, so that you can cite what's there, what's not there, level of alterations, level of integrity. Um, and I would say too, with respect to the significance of a site, this is where I think for traditional cultural places, oral histories are particularly important. <laughs> Um, much of uh, many times uh, the significance is not written down by a community. It's passed on through an oral tradition. Um, and oral histories will play uh, as as legitimate a role in documentation as do maps and journal articles and books. And and is the party denying access to the site the owner of the site? Um, because that might or might not be the case, but also just bearing in mind um, you know, the, the sort of inconvenient truth that if that is the owner denying access, the owner may or may not be in favor of the listing of that site. So when the documentation is prepared, um, it may well result in a determination of eligibility as opposed to a listing in the National Register, but both certainly afford the same consideration in the Section 106 lane. And then perhaps in this hypothetical scenario, at a future date, a, a new owner may be in favor of listing, at which point it could move to listing. I mean, those, those situations arise as well. And before we get our two minute warning on our session, I do wanna say, I so appreciate the conversations, the comments and the questions that are going on here in the chat. All of this will be incredibly helpful and meaningful in our continued uh, efforts to revise the TC people and make sure that what we've written is addressing some of these, these issues, these comments and questions, because if it's not clear, it's not going to be helpful. Uh, and there will always be room for more uh, examples. And I'm seeing some, some really uh, thoughtful comments about what we might include in terms of examples. So I thank you all for that. There is a question that says, has um, the TCP concept been used to list African-American communities that have been continually occupied by the same families, but the buildings are modified and lack the usual level of integrity for a historic district? Hmm. So. Let me just say as a threshold um, response that Integrity really has a great deal of flexibility. 
Uh, there are those seven aspects. Buildings can be modified. If you take a look at the bulletin, there is one example that I did include, not a TCP, but a, such a good example of how modification can happen. We hear a lot of talk uh, and concern about um, new facades, uh, or not facades, but finishes, uh, form stone, aluminum siding on buildings. Those are not deal breakers in terms of integrity. So I would say the same is true uh, for a property that may be uh, thought of as a TCP. There is flexibility there. Again, it's important to explain in the nomination why the place is, is significant and why it has integrity, um, how it conveys its significance through what you're seeing. And I see we have our, our timeout notice, and it's time for us to wrap this up. So I thank you all for participating. Again, fantastic uh, comments and questions. I thank Julie, Paul, Lisa, and I thank our tremendous team at the National Trust for the support in doing this presentation. Thank you all. Take care. Thanks, everybody.